What do you get when you cross a caterpillar and a parrot? A caterpillar, remember, my kids wrote some of these. They were different ages. A caterpillar and a parrot, a walkie talkie. Oh. Okay, what movie did the pirate watch? Uh, what was the what was the rating of the movie that the pirate watched? R. Rated R. Very good. They were really proud of that one. Okay. Uh, how about this one? What do you get when you cross a vampire with a snowman? Frostbite. Well done. I thought that was apropos for the season that we're in. You guys know there's another storm coming, right? Monday. Oh yeah. Look out, baby. Here we go. I'll be here. The class is. If the university's open, I'll be here, okay? You might be parking right outside of that door, but I'll be here, okay? I know, bundle up, call mom and dad, tell them you need more warm clothes. I think a lot of the models, you know, they're all over the place, the, the weather models. Yeah, we're not talking about the weather today, but I, I, I'm kind of a weather nerd. So uh, I think we're probably gonna get maybe five and maybe six in town between Monday and Tuesday. Inches, yeah, inches. It may get downgraded. We'll see. Okay. Well, that really got you guys going. All right. I should have waited until I saw some of you falling asleep before I mentioned the weather on Monday. Okay. Let's get into it. Let's get into it. So you're staying after class. If you need access to the textbook, we'll walk through a little bit of stuff. Um, and right now, I need we need to buckle down and get through some cell biology. Again, here's the challenge of this week. Okay, this week is review material. It's stuff you've already had. I'm trying to paint it in a new light, I'm trying to make it interesting, more interesting maybe than it was the first time, but also hopefully planning some ideas of, oh, wow, I'm actually glad that I took that class because I kind of remember what it's talking about. You read the textbook, you fill in the blanks, okay, you take the chapter quiz, you see maybe what you're missing. And this is foundational stuff for human anatomy and physiology. So those courses you took in high school, the prerequisites that you took here at the university or at another university, they weren't just busy work. They're laying the foundation, the vocabulary, the understanding. Some light bulbs may go off today because maybe we'll say it in a different way or it's relevant to the human body. So it's more interesting to you, but actually it was basic chemistry on Monday and it's basic cell biology today. Okay. And we're doing an entire semester in one hour in about 10 minutes, okay? So we're going to go fast. But the reality is we've already had this, and we're hopefully kind of just brushing up on stuff uh, to remind you. Cells. Cells are the building blocks of our body. It's what we're constructed of. That's where life begins. That's what we said in our introductory lecture. That was a Zoom lecture, right? Those Zoom lectures are on YouTube. All right, you can find that on the syllabus, and hopefully you're using that as a study tool. How would you use that as a study tool? Well, before the exam, maybe you look at your notes, and I had one student come up after class uh, Monday and said, you know, I'm, I'm kind of having a little trouble, and this is not unusual. I'm listening to you. I'm trying to write my notes. I'm listening to you. I think I'm missing stuff because I can't really listen to you, digest it, and also write it down. So that's the whole point of having a recording, or maybe you listen more, lean into the lecture more, because you're here for now in 15, and you took the time to come, take some notes, and then go back and rewatch those lectures at whatever speed you need them. You can pause, you can rewind, you can fill in the gaps of your notes where you think there's important stuff. Okay? So just a study tip on how to do this. Our understanding of cells began in the 1600s, and we had suspicion that there was something there, but until we could see it, we didn't believe it and we couldn't actually name it, and then we couldn't actually define what it does or uh, pontificate about what it might do or what's inside of it. And that was Robert Hooke who invented the light microscope. And you probably learned that in basic biology, but it opened up a whole new realm of cell biology, okay? And in the space of cell biology, we've been studying these cells. We've been um, manipulating these cells. We've been taking them out of the body. We culture them in a laboratory. We analyze them. We try to push them down a certain lineage. We try to change them. And we learn by playing with cells. We do this in my laboratory here at NAU. It's a cell-based therapy lab. 
Uh, we do a lot of regenerative medicine and tissue engineering that I told you about. And one of the things that we do is playing with cells. Some of those are stem cells. Now, some of the earliest cells that you could actually get your hands on as a scientist were actually in uh, the 1950s. And this was a, um, a physician named Dr. Uh, Gay, G-E-Y, George Otto Gay. And he actually took a sample of cells from an individual in 1951 without her permission. It was actually a cervical cancer cell line and <clears throat> discovered that they grew really well outside of the body. And <clears throat> then he started passing them to some of his friends, science buddies, okay? They started growing them. They would freeze them down in specialized freezers. And then they would thaw them out and they would do experiments to understand things about cells. Anybody have an idea of who that individual was that they took the cells from? There's a hand. It's a HeLa cell line, but it's an abbreviation. So we keep the individual confidential, but I'm gonna blab it right here. But everybody knows it now. Henrietta Lacks, Henrietta Lacks. And this was a super controversial um, case, Henrietta Lacks. In fact, it went all the way to the Supreme Court of California. And the Supreme Court of California actually decided, what do you think they decided? Where the family, obviously she passed away from cervical cancer, but her cells have been immortalized. There's actually a really great book about the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks. Okay. And uh, I really encourage you to learn, uh, read it if you're interested in this, because this is like the origin of cell-based therapies. Right, was with this woman and her family. Her family was not happy, you can imagine. They got nothing, they got no royalties, no recognition. I mean, now they're getting recognition, right? I'm recognizing them. You guys understand who they are. What do you think the Supreme Court decided about those cells? Yeah. You can't take people's blood without permission. You would think you can't do that. You can't take those cells without permission. Better off than you took them. It's better off than we took them. They didn't say it that way, but they said once the cells leave the patient's body, they no longer belong to that patient. But now all the informed consents that you guys sign, you know, you have to read like all that stuff and sign. A lot of that legalese is from that case in the 1950s, okay? We've done cell observations for um, 200 plus years now that had led to the cell theory in the early 1800s, okay? Over 200 years of cell observations, the early 1800s, <clears throat> we came up with the cell theory, but cell biology isn't old. It's not archaic, right? HeLa cell lines are still being cultured in labs today. Stem cells are being taken from patients. You might know people that have banked their stem cells, or maybe there was a, 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 a birth of a sibling, or maybe you have placental stem cells or vampal stem cells that mom and dad cryopreserved for later use. If you'd like to donate to me, stay after class and we'll, we'll get you on the, I'm just kidding. But these cell experiments continue today and the origins are back in the 1600s. Now in the 1800s, we came up with this cell theory and it's stayed for quite a while, okay? The 1800s was, this was nearly 200 years ago. So now we've got 400 approximate years of playing with cells and the cell theory still stands about 200 years. Here are the four tenets. Cells are the basic structural um, and functional unit of life and they share certain generalized features. Number one, organisms are composed of one or more cells. Cells Cell functions are carried out by subcellular structures called organelles, and you study that. That's the stuff inside the cell. And then all cells arose from pre-existing cells. And this cell theory was credited to a number of different individuals, right? And of course, this is probably going to be challenged in history because there were other people behind the scenes that were responsible for this, but because they weren't men, they didn't get their name written down, right? So in the textbooks of today, that are being rewritten. We have observations of Hook, Leeuwenhoek, Schneidel, Schwann, Virchow, and many others, right? And, and so as you study this, there are some really, it's not that they did anything wrong, it's just that's what the social norms were of the day, but they missed out on a lot of their people that were on their team uh, that led to these four tenets that actually we still use today. 
So what's inside of a typical cell? <clears throat> well, we usually have a membrane, a plasma or a cell membrane on the outside. That's the boundary between the outside environment and the inside environment. And that is absolutely critical, folks. The outside and the inside environment have to be different. And when they become the same, when is that observed, when they become the same? When the inside and the outside environment are the same of a cell. Death, yeah, it, the cell's dead, okay? That would be static, nothing's changing. We separate the interior or the cytoplasm from the extracellular fluid. Now they're very similar, the inside fluid and the outside fluid, but there are unique differences that we're going to dive into the weeds on this semester. And I, I, I gotta do it here. So when we get into um, <clears throat> the muscle membrane and we start looking at ion potentials, you're not just completely confused. It starts, that's just a cell, it's a specialized cell. A muscle cell is a specialized cell but it has a membrane. You separate stuff from the outside and the inside, then you open up gates and you allow certain ions to come in. And now all of a sudden you have a voltage change if that ion has a positive charge. If it has a voltage change, now you have an electrical potential. That's a signal. That's what your cell phone does. And you pay attention to it all day long, right? Your muscles do that, your neurons do that. Their neurons are specialized cells. They're no different than this generic, plain vanilla, boring cell that you studied in high school. But we start here, and then we're going to start flattening it out, stretching it out, giving it different appendages, and they become more specialized as we dive into the semester. You go to 3.1.2 in your chapter, and you're going to see a really nice detail of all of these organelles. Okay, I want you to think about this as a factory, the cell. The cell is alive. <clears throat> it's the basic unit of life in us. Multiple cells make up a tissue. Multiple tissues make up an organ. We're going to get into that next week. We start studying tissues. Okay. So <clears throat> this is like a factory where you've got the nucleus, right? That's the director manager that tells the cell what to do. And <clears throat> that's where the DNA is housed. You've got an assembly line. That's the endomembrane system. Endomembrane system means inside the cell, there are membranes that are packaging things and moving things around like a UPS truck, okay? They actually have a sequence on them to tell them, do you stay inside the cell, like a zip code, or do you spit this out, exocytose it, and put it out into the extracellular matrix? If it's actin, you keep it inside the cell because actin makes up the cytoskeletal filaments that keep the structure of the cell. If it's collagen, you spit it out of the cell because it actually needs to go in the extracellular matrix that allows the cell to attach to it. So the cell actually makes and packages this, these things with what we would quote unquote call zip codes through this endomembrane transport. There's a lot of support functions. These support functions involve other organelles and cytosol components. And <clears throat> you're gonna see some of those things when you look at um, your textbook and you go to section 3.1.2. Products, right, in those packages, these products that we have are like actin and collagen. And they're either put inside the cell to support the cell function, or they're extruded outside of the cell to support extracellular function. So this is a factory and they're working all the time. They're working all the time, even while you're at rest, even when you're sleeping at night. In fact, a lot of regeneration of tissues happens and growth of tissues happens during your resting hours. Okay? Your metabolism drops. And so you have more metabolic energy available to heal, to grow if you're pre-adolescent, right? Your growth plates haven't closed. All right, <clears throat> why are cells so small? This is a question that I, 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 I tend to get quite a bit. I mean, our cells are about 10 to 50 microns or micrometers. In comparison, a frog egg is about one to three millimeters. And you've got large cells, like a giant squid has a 39 foot long uh, cell or an ostrich egg itself is a single cell and it's about six inches long. So why is such diversity? Why aren't our cells any bigger? Well, it actually comes down to efficiency. 
And so the simple answer is small cells are more efficient. They can more easily transport and transpire materials into and out of themselves. You can do more quickly with a smaller cell. And the strategy that we use is many cells in a tissue versus like three cells that make up your heart. Okay. So efficiency is why we have smaller cells. You get better diffusion properties. We're going to talk about transporting cells, uh, things in and out of a cell in the end of the lecture. We're going to talk about osmosis, moving of ions. This stuff happens much more quickly if you have many cells. So think about this classroom. Those of you in the back can see the classroom. Those of you in the front need to turn around. Turn around real quick and look at the classroom. <clears throat> what if, okay, what if there was confetti that fell in this room right now? It would that be kind of cool, wouldn't it? And then I asked you to clean it up. How much more efficient are we at cleaning up that confetti? 350 of you. Actually, there's probably 348 in here. There's two, two folks auditing. 348 of you picking up confetti versus we have one individual, two individual, and a third individual. So you have 348 versus three cells cleaning up confetti, which is a more efficient. Do you see the difference? That's why we do it the way we do it, or that's why it's designed the way it is in us. Okay, it's for efficiency. So how do we see them if they're so small? Well, you guys in lab are going to be playing this week. 201 lab starts right this week. If you have it, great. If you have it, please attend. And you're going to start looking at microscopes. You shine visible light, full spectrum white light at a sample, and you illuminate it. Okay, and you magnify it. And you're going to be playing around with light microscopes. You can also use an electron microscope. Electron microscopes shines electrons at the sample, and then it deflects, it collects those electrons and reconstructs an image. So we either in, in cell biology will use light microscopy or electron microscopy to see these things. Okay, <clears throat> the cell membrane. I'm gonna play a real quick video. I hope it works because I want to give you a visible moving picture of what the cell membrane looks like before we start studying it. Between the living machinery of the inner cell and the harsh conditions of the outside world stands the cell membrane. That was super as loud, sorry. As this barrier is, it's surprisingly flexible. For it it wants it move. Hold hard enough and it might break and begin to regroup. You see that? How it falls apart? Okay, that's all I wanted. That's all I wanted you to see. Um, the whole point of that is for you to have kind of an idea in your mind of a moving structure it's not a wall okay and that's one of the biggest tripping points that i think students have with cell biology is the cell membrane is we're going to talk about this fluid mosaic theory it is literally fluid right it's movable well, you saw that video you saw how if you disrupt it you can actually move your phospholipid bilayer and detach those things and they come right back together right the hydrophobic sections stay away from water and the hydrophilic sections uh, stay towards water. So <clears throat> the functions of this membrane, every time in, in cell biology uh, textbooks, we draw a static membrane. And I wanted you to see a video so that you know that this thing, remember the pool analogy that I had on Monday with the styrofoam balls we throw out and cover an entire pool surface with styrofoam balls, right? And then the pool pump comes on and the water's swirling and those styrofoam balls, some of them are painted a different color. You can see the blue styrofoam balls moving from the shallow end to the, to the deep end or a, a green styrofoam ball moving from the deep end to the shallow end. So this structure isn't still like we see in textbooks. It moves. Embedded in it are these proteins, these transmembrane proteins, and they function um, to do many different things that we're gonna talk about today. A lot of times it's moving things across the barriers, okay? So the plasma membrane, 
barrier, gatekeeper, support the shape of the cell, and communication with other cells. So cells will actually handshake with each other and, and actually interact and actually have a conversation when they bind to each other. How are they having a conversation, Todd? Well, they attach. The other side of that protein that's inside the cell actually has connections to the nucleus and they use signaling molecules when they attach to another cell or they attach to an extracellular matrix protein like collagen and they tell the nucleus to do something like, hey, we're going to start migrating. We're going to divide. Okay. I'm seeing an area that's a gap in the collagen. This must be a wound bed. Let's actually signal the nucleus to divide and make another fibroblast if we're talking about a skin fibroblast. Okay. So that's coming in the next week. But we got to get to that stepwise as we talk about what these things do. So you've got a phospholipid bilayer with proteins embedded in it. You've got the polar heads and the phosphate groups. Then you have the nonpolar tails, the neutral acids. We talked about this in chemistry on Monday. You remember? This fluid mosaic theory, right? So the best way I can describe that is showing you the video or the swimming pool analogy. These were individuals that discovered it and, and, and reported on it. In 1972, we came up with this fluid mosaic theory. 1972. When did Robert Cook start the microscope? 16 what? 1663. I mean, this is a long time later that we come up with this video that I just showed you, right? Because every prep that we're looking at isn't live. <clears throat> so Singer and Nicholson proposed this theory and they get the credit for this fluid mosaic model. Okay, cell membranes made of two layers of phospholipids. The phospholipids, a large molecule based on a triglyceride, has a phosphate head, which is water loving or hydrophilic and has a fatty acid tail, which is hydrophobic. Number three, the phosphate head forms the outside of the layer and attracts water. Number four, the fatty acid is repelled by the water and points towards the middle of the molecule. And they were the ones that described it being a fluid state not static. You saw in the video, you add in cholesterol in these membranes and you actually strengthen or support it. It's kind of like rebar and concrete. So cholesterol is valuable. Remember last time we met on Monday, I talked about you can manufacture your own cholesterol in your body. Do you remember that? About how much cholesterol can you manufacture what you need? 85%. This is some of the stuff you need it for, is to actually reinforce your cell membranes. So this picture on the upper right is an electron micrograph using electron uh, imaging, and this is the phospholipid bilayer. So if you look carefully, the darker area, right, are the heads, and the darker area is pointed outwards, and then you can almost appreciate like a ladder-like structure in between the two darker layers. Use your imagination a little bit, but that's kind of how you have to get trained with electron microscopy. You can appreciate the tail region, and this is the membrane of the cell, okay? What things can get in? <clears throat> well, the bilayer limits what can come across it, unaided, just can transport. Small, uncharged, nonpolar molecules, will easily cross, like oxygen, carbon dioxide, urea. Water actually goes through channels. So we describe this membrane as being selectively permeable. So now I pose the question, how does other stuff get in to the cell or out? Transport proteins. Transport proteins. Okay, we're gonna talk about that here as the lecture goes on. So these transport proteins, um, are very, very important. And <clears throat> they're integral membrane proteins that are embedded in the membrane. You can see these here in this slide. Uh, it's kind of a recapitulation of some prior images that you've seen in these slide decks. Um, but it's embedded in the membrane. It bridges the entire width of the plasma membrane. And the peripheral proteins are associated with the process membrane, but they're not necessarily in it. And you can see some of these peripheral proteins 
as you look at um, this image over here, where you know it's it's not all the way through. Um, it's stuck and embedded in it. This peripheral protein is probably has a function of interaction with the extracellular environment or with another cell. Now, <clears throat> most of these are glycoproteins. So that's a sugar-coated protein. That's all it is. There's usually a glycocalyx or the coating that's on the extracellular side of the plasma membrane. And the functions, you can see across the bottom here, all the different described functions of these membrane proteins. We've got receptors, enzymes, channel proteins, gated channels, cell identity markers, cell adhesion mo mo uh, molecules. Cell adhesion molecules is how it connects to collagen or how it actually attaches to another cell, okay? That's important if you're trying to make a tissue, right? You want two cells of the same kind to graft together and, and form a tissue. So these functions are critical to the survival of, of, of the cell and therefore for the tissue. Now we classify them in a couple of different ways. We can actually class, classify these proteins as either fibrous or structural, or we classify them as globular or functional. So structural proteins, they're long, they're rigid, they're rod-like. I was quoting two examples, collagen and actin, that are structural proteins. They're uh, fibrous proteins. They have, they look like rope, like a braided rope. Okay, so if you look at this right here, this is a uh, triple helical coil. And if anybody's a boater, you know, or a climber, you know that if you braid rope, the more cords that you put in there, the stronger it is, right? So these structural or fibrous proteins are like braided rope. And you have outside examples called fibronectin, elastin, vitronectin. All of these are extracellular matrix proteins. Okay? Inside the cell, um, actin and myosin. And we're gonna look in the skeletal muscle lectures, when we look at muscle physiology, the role of specialized actin and specialized myosin in a specialized cell, a muscle cell. And we're gonna see how they actually slide across each other so that you can actually write, you can actually wave, you can chew food, you can do muscle contraction because of inside structural proteins that actually move across each other, actin and myosin. So we'll get there. So when we get there, I'll point you back to the fact that you've already learned about actin. You already learned about actin in cell biology and the muscle cell is just a specialized cell and the actin and the myosin are organized in a very unique fashion. But the inside parts are the exact same. These are not very soluble. That means they don't go into water very well, which that's a good thing, right? If 50 to 75% of the body is water and these things dissolve in water, that would be bad, right? So they're not tremendously soluble. In fact, if you play with elastin, for example, we, we actually recombinantly produce kilogram quantities of human elastin. That means we transfect organisms to crank out elastin and then we harvest it. And we use it for all sorts of different things, okay? And one of the ways that we try to solubilize it is by changing the pH. Ah, remember that on Monday? So we'll take the solution, if you put tropal, if you put elastin in water and you stir it, it's, it's cloudy, okay? You start raising the pH or lowering the pH, acidic or basic, Usually acidic is better, like glacial acetic acid, you drop the pH, it goes into solution, okay? But in the body, because we have a very neutral pH, your collagen, your elastin, your structural proteins don't go into solution, which is actually really a good thing. Now let's look at globular or functional proteins. We already talked about this on Monday. What's this molecule? What's that molecule? Hemoglobin, right? That's its quaternary architecture. That was what we learned on Monday. You can see we've got alpha, two alpha chains, two beta chains. Uh, these chains actually, you can see how they're not, you, you could unwind this pink chain, right? Can you imagine unwinding the pink chain and making a primary sequence? 
And now you fold it, you make the secondary, you fold it again, you make the tertiary, and then the quaternary architecture is it with other globular elements. And we've got four iron molecules that are four binding sites for oxygen. This is um, a soluble protein. This is something that goes into solution. Now think about it. Your blood is mostly water, right? You actually want the solubility where the polar groups are out and the non-polar groups are in because you actually want it to go into solution in your blood, okay? So depending upon the purpose, these proteins are gonna have different characteristics in us, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. Okay. <clears throat> I want you guys to um, do this exercise, right? Where you're gonna put in order, you can take out a scratch piece of paper, you can do it right in your notes. Put in order, these organelles or cell parts as they exist in protein synthesis. So start at the beginning of protein synthesis. So I'll give you a hint. Where are you gonna start? the nucleus, okay? Now go from the nucleus out. Okay. Let's do this. Instead of passing the mics, we're just going to shout it out. You think you're right, okay? We go from the nucleus to where next? We go to I'll, when I hear the answer that's correct, I'll acknowledge it. Keep shouting it. What, ribosome, perfect. Then where? Nucleus, ribosome, rough ER, vesicle, Golgi, lysosome. Plasma membrane, okay? So I would review that. Very simple level one based question, cell biology. It could be a test question. Yeah. The lysosome uh, processes or pathogens it. And in some circumstances, that lysosome is just actually keeping it internal. In other circumstances, it's gonna fuse the membrane and spit it out. Okay. It's like a uh, the final packaging, if you will. Okay. okay. We're going to talk a little bit about cellular respiration. And I didn't know how this was going to translate. <laughs> I've got three blue boxes there that I'm going to uncover. So you can either put an asterisk two asterisks, three asterisks next to glycolysis, Krebs, and electron transport chain, or you can just write it in, okay? If you're, if you're writing utensil, we'll write over that blue box, um, go for it. You don't have to put an asterisk, but you can write it in here, write it in here, write it in here. Where does glycolysis occur in the, in, in the cell or in relationship to the cell? Glycolysis. Review, this is a review. Glycolysis is not necessarily, no, cytoplasm, thank you, cytoplasm, okay? So the cytoplasm, what about the Krebs cycle? Where does that occur? Krebs cycle. And what are we talking about here with glycolysis? We're talking about the manufacturing of what? ATP, thank you, okay. Where does Krebs cycle take place? Yes, sir. Mitochondrial matrix, very good. And then how about the electron transport chain or the ETC?
in the membrane space. Well done, okay? In the inner membrane. The hydrogen ions for the ETC are actually shuttled into the inner membrane space. So that's a more correct answer, the most correct answer. Well done. So again, for review, for the sake of um, completeness, we've got the ability to manufacture ATP or energy, adenosine triphosphate. We talked about this energy source Monday through three different pathways. We can actually either generate ATP from proteins, carbohydrates, or fats. Okay. And they're going to enter either into glycolysis or the citric acid cycle based upon whether or not there's oxygen present. Okay. What their precursor is and whether or not oxygen is present. And I told you I wasn't going to drill you on the exam of all the different steps of glycolysis and aerobic respiration. I don't need you to memorize the enzymes and what happens. I do want you to know what we covered today, where things take place, what it manufactures. You should know approximately that glycolysis nets you two ATP and the, the aerobic respiration will give you approximately another 34 to 36 net. All right, so 34 to 36 plus the two from glycolysis will give you 36 to 38, all right? Depending upon how you're counting with the NADH of the things. All right, so, I mean, I won't split hairs and you're gonna try to decide between, well, he said it was 36 or 38. I see C is 36 and, and D is 38. Which one is it, all right? But if I say 14, you know that answer's wrong. You guys with me? If I say one, you know that answer's wrong. And if I have it backwards, like glycolysis needs oxygen, you know that's false. Does that make sense? So I want you to be familiar enough where you can answer these basic questions on the exam, okay? All right, <clears throat> take out another piece of paper or another note. I want you to define these four terms. They all look very similar. Glycolysis, glycogenolysis, glucomyogenesis, and glycogen. See if you can define all four of these. If you need to work with your partner, fine, okay? Maybe you take two, they take two. How are we doing? All right, how about glycolysis? Who would like to take a stab at just defining glycolysis? Simple, simple answer, simple definition. Breakdown of glucose to generate what? Pyruvate to get ATP, okay? Glycogenolysis. Glycogenolysis. Any uh, volunteers? Okay. Okay, that was awesome, by the way. Okay, did you guys hear that in the back? He said, I don't... We actually really know what it means, but if I try to break down the word, I think it's probably the breakdown of glycogen because you see glycogen and you see lysis, and you'd be absolutely correct. And so if you kind of lean into the class and start thinking about terminology and you learn some of the vocabulary, it will really help. It's perfect. Gluconeogenesis. This one's a little tougher. Mm -hmm. Yes, the production of new glucose, okay, 
It is an anabolic process. You had me confused when you said anabolizing, but yeah, it's an anabolic process, um, making new glucose. Okay, so if you break down that word, you see gluconeogenesis. So it literally translates in the Greek, gluco, new beginning. You see that? It's kind of cool. So <clears throat> this is a metabolic pathway through substances like lactate, glycerol, or even amino acids. You can actually manufacture new glucose from scratch. And then the last one, glycogen. This one should be easy. Who wants to go? Someone in the back? Way in the back, yep. A monomer of glucose or polymer? Polymer of glucose. Very good. Very good. I love how you use that for Monday. Well done. Okay. So <clears throat> you perform a chemical analysis of a bone cell called an osteocyte. We'll learn about those later. You find it contains large amounts of pyruvate. You determine that what has occurred based upon what we've learned so far or what we've reviewed so far. What's taking place? Large amounts of uh, pyruvate. Gluconeogenesis, the Krebs cycle, glycogenolysis, two of these or none of these? Well, C is just referring to glycogen being broke down. It doesn't tell you that glycolysis has happened. None of them, why? Glycolysis isn't on the list, it would be E, very good. Okay, you were getting there. Okay, <clears throat> everybody confused or everybody okay? Everybody shy? Fair enough, fair enough. You guys will warm up as the semester goes, I promise. Let's talk about moving things across this membrane. Okay, we're gonna move some water, we're gonna move some solutes. Um, when we get into nerve physiology and muscle physiology, we're going to uh, move some ions. So right now, membrane transport, <clears throat> remember Monday, we talked about a solvent um, and a solute equals a solution, okay? And we said in the beginning of this class, the only time you had the extracellular matrix concentration or extracellular environment is equal to the intracellular environment. The only time that happens is when you have what? A dead cell, right? So in living cells, you never have those being the same. Stuff is always moving one direction or the other, okay? Sometimes it moves without energy through diffusion. It doesn't require ATP. This is why we're going over energy production like ATP because it's critical for a living cell. Some things will move down a concentration gradient, just normal diffusion, but from high to low, doesn't require energy. Some things will move against a concentration gradient. They go from low to high, and it requires energy in a carrier to move it. Okay? So when we look at passive transport versus active transport, no energy is required for passive transport. And <clears throat> we have things like sugar, ions, amino acids. They can move from passive transport very easily. Now, they can also go through um, active transport if they're going against their concentration gradient. But active transport requires energy, and it goes from low to high. It goes against the gradient. Basic principles. Simple diffusion. Simple diffusion is this. Small lipid-soluble substances. Why does it have to be lipid-soluble? Because it's got a what? It's got to move through the membrane. Exactly. Whew. I'm hoping I didn't lose everybody with that. Right? That's why, I mean, we're talking about moving things across a cell membrane. So now it's got to be lipid soluble. So what are some examples of substances that will move through the membrane itself? Remember the video, you just push on it and everything kind of disrupts, right? Well, there's little gaps in between. And if it's lipid soluble, stuff can move through there. Yeah, some examples. Sodium, no, not sodium. It's not lipid soluble. Think about gases. Some examples, oxygen, 
Carbon dioxide, I hear. Carbon dioxide, fat soluble vitamins, believe it or not. Okay. So, how many of you are like nutrition buffs and you take supplements? Come on, raise your hand. Take a vitamin, daily vitamin. Come on, guys. You're like telling your mom, I didn't eat my vegetables, but I take a vitamin, mom. I'm good. All right. How many of you are taking vitamins? Okay. So, water soluble versus fat soluble vitamins. Okay. For the future nurses and nutritionists and physicians that raise your hand on Monday, your patients are telling you that they're taking three multivitamins a day. Why is that a problem? Uh, Did you guys hear that? That's perfect. If they're fat soluble vitamins, lipid soluble vitamins, they'll be stored within the lipid or in the cell itself because they can move through the membrane. If it's a water soluble vitamin like vitamin C, you know, Linus Pauling, I think, was on record taking like eight grams a day and you live to like, you know, 98 years of age. You just excrete water soluble vitamins in excess. You just have like really expensive urine. But fat soluble vitamins can become dangerous because you store them in the cell itself. So fat soluble vitamins, oxygen, carbon dioxide, these are things that just move through the membrane, okay? Now, osmosis, this diagram is a picture of what's happening with osmosis. So what I want you to see is, you know, water is gonna move when solutes can't. So when is that going to happen? Well, if you've got a selectively permeable membrane like the cell, and there are certain solutes that can't get in or out because they're too big, right? And they're not fat soluble. Water will actually go through channels and go from an area of low solute to an area of high solute. Let me repeat that. Water will move from an area of low solute to an area of high solute. And that's called osmosis. So the movement of water down a concentration grade. Okay. So if you see this beaker, this is a beaker full of, uh, with a semi-permeable membrane. That's the dotted line down the middle from side A to side B. And the small molecules in, in little blue spheres are water. And the larger molecules are solute, okay, the orange molecules. And after about 30 minutes, these orange molecules can't move to an area of low concentration over here. So what the water does is it goes from an area of low solute to an area of high solute, and it actually fills this side of the semi-permeable membrane. This is exactly the same principle that happens inside your cell, especially with little cells like blood cells. Okay, this is a red blood cell. And I want you to answer this question. It's been put into a solution, either an isotonic, hypertonic, hypotonic. And I want you to tell me which solution has led to this red blood cell looking like this. Okay. Now, this hypotonic, isotonic, hypertonic is in reference to the solution and its tonicity. Go ahead, over here. No, the cell is not bloated. The cell is actually shrunk. Oh, oh. Dr. Keller, critical information. Okay. So, okay, if you don't get it, I wanted, I, I actually moved the slides around a little bit because I wanted to see if you knew it before I explained it. I'm going to explain it here in a second. Any guesses? I'm going to, since you went already, I'm going to let this young lady have a chance here. Hypertonic solution. That is correct. B, hypertonic solution. So let's look at this slide. And in your notes, depending on when you downloaded the slides, if you download this afternoon, they look like this. Download yesterday, these are out of order. Water concentration, right, <clears throat> uh, depends on the number of solutes in it. And so it's either a hypertonic, isotonic, or hypotonic, and water is going to move down its concentration, concentration gradient until it reaches an equilibrium. That's what goes in that blank. So on the left, you have a hypotonic solution that this cell is sitting in. Hypotonic solution would be like distilled water. There's no salt in it. There's no solutes. 
So where's the water going to go if the cell is dropped in distilled water? The water is going to go into the cell because the cell has solutes and it's going to swell. The middle one is what a red blood cell normally looks like. Okay, it's got a uh, sort of a con biconcave structure to it. So that is in an isotonic solution where the uh, saline is about 0.9% sodium chloride, which if you're ever in the ER, and you're ever admitted to the hospital and you take a look at the IV bag, that's what's considered normal saline that you're gonna put and give your patients, okay? The future nurses, you're gonna put in an IV line, you're going to put in a bag of 0.9% sodium chloride drip solution, buffered, right? Now you know why it's buffered. And then you're going to add drugs to that, add medications to that, okay? Because you don't mess anything up. You put straight water into the patient, you'll kill the patient. Or make them really sick until the doctor shows up or somebody figures out what's going on. So 0.9% sodium chloride is an isotonic solution. The far right one is what we call crenated. And this one's in a um, hypertonic solution, like what we just saw in the test question or the sample test question. And that could be any kind of thing bigger than 0.9%, like a 2% sodium chloride solution. So now you're in a hypertonic solution. There's more solutes outside the cell and the water leaves the red blood cell and the red blood cell actually shrinks in creams. There was a hand up over here. So it's a great question. So you wouldn't say this is a hypotonic cell. It's a hypo, it's a cell in a hypotonic solution. Just just you know. Accuracy on the nomenclature, and I don't want to confuse students. So this is a cell in a hypotonic solution. Okay, so the water rushes in. The question for the back is, can that only happen in the example that you gave when you you put an IV bag and you put water in it instead of saline? Um, no. So remember we talked the other day about um, Monday. We talked about uh, extreme athletes drinking lots of water as you're sweating. And you're not drinking, you're not eating any salt or having any like Gatorade or any sugar or magnesium or potassium. You get some of the same type of effects. Now you're not going to probably die, but you're going to get very sick, and not feel great. If you're sweating profusely, heavy exercise, and the only thing you're consuming is water, then you are essentially trading physiology like this. Okay. So Gatorade, funny story. How much time do I got? Okay. 14 minutes. Gatorade was a funny story, interesting story. It was a professor, an exercise science professor at the University of Florida that was developing a drink for the football team and came up with the formula of Gatorade. That's, they're the Gators, right? And, um, and that's where Gatorade came from. So it, it's actually uh, physiologically developed. Now, a lot of the sport drinks of today have way too much sugar in it um, from a physiology standpoint. They're great for fast energy because that sugar, that sucrose, you can break that sucrose down into glucose and fructose and actually run glycolysis and get fast energy. But you know, for, for long distance, it's not great. Yeah, you'll get fast energy. But Gatorade is actually really quite good. Okay, let's look at it from a different angle. Okay, and I think you see something like this in your textbook. Okay, this is a figure very similar to chapter three textbook. So we've got um, each of these. This is the same exact question, folks. I just want to ask in a different way. What do you think will happen in each of these situations? You take a, uh, a cell, it's got 10% glucose in it, and you're dropping that cell into, on the left, a 20% glucose solution, distilled water in the middle, and then a 10% glucose solution. What do you think is going to happen? Let's say on the far left, for question one, what's going to happen? 10% into 20%. It's going to shrink. Okay. 10% into distilled water. It's going to swell. 10% cell into 10% glucose. Stay the same, right? No net change. Okay. I think you all got it. Questions?
All right. All right, let's talk about facilitated active and bulk transport in our remaining time. So with these slides, the theme that we have that's really critical for you to remember is <clears throat> we're really trying to understand when the cell needs something inside that won't move by diffusion or we can't use osmosis to get it in there. What mechanisms do we have to make that happen? Okay. So we've got protein assisted diffusion. We can actually use transporters or carriers. Um, we can actually run glucose with this. We use pores, in other words. A lot of these are gated. You see this figure at the bottom where you've got a fossil with a bilayer, you've got a membrane, extracellular fluid, that's ECF, intracellular fluid, that's ICF, and you're moving these through this carrier one at a time. This is like what happens with nerve cells, and we're going to get there. So I want you to see it first here so that you understand when we see it later. Oh, yeah, now I understand. We're just talking about a very basic cell. That's specialized. So we're just moving stuff across the membrane. Yeah, that's how we're getting an action potential. That's how the nerve fires. That's how you send a signal down the nerve. Okay, got it. So the movement of solute against a concentration gradient is when you need active transport because energy is required. You need energy input, okay? It's like rolling a ball uphill. It requires you to push it versus rolling a ball downhill. You just drop it and it goes. Proteins are sometimes called pumps. And this is a primary active transport, sodium potassium pump. And we're gonna be talking about this at length this semester. And this is the first introduction of it. I know you've already had this before, basic bio, many of you, but I'm reintroducing it. So here's our membrane, here's our channel. That channel allows things to move out and it allows things to move in. And you have to take an ATP, cleave off a phosphate, liberate energy and make adenosine diphosphate. So you go from triphosphate to diphosphate. And when you do that, you release energy. This pump runs all day long in most of your cells. Okay, it's like Captain America. I could do this all day. Okay, so you can take three sodiums out and you bring two potassiums in. Now, three out, two in, there's a net one. I know this isn't mathematics, I get it, but I think you all can do that math, right? So that net charge that's missing creates a charge differential. That's what we call a potential, a charge differential a charge at the level of the membrane, okay? So it's more positive out and it's slightly negative in because you pushed three positives out and you only brought two in. Secondary active transport. <clears throat> this is kind of interesting because one of these molecules takes a ride, right? So you create this um, gradient, right? So down here, we've got this pump running, and we're pumping out sodium. Up here, we're gonna allow sodium to come in because it's high outside and it's low inside. We open that channel, sodium comes in and glucose just catches a ride with it. So because you've got a sodium pump down here that requires energy, it's still active transport, but it's called secondary active transport. So the SGLT is a sodium glucose transporter. And it's a way that we bring glucose into the cell down the sodium concentration gradient. But we use a transporter that leverages the gradient that's formed by the ATPase that's utilized and the ATP that's burned in moving sodium out of the cell. Does that make sense? So now we're starting to get into layers of sophistication with respect to how we're moving things. So the sodium potassium pump, <clears throat> What does it do? Well, it maintains a resting potential. We kind of already said some of this. We said that it is a higher potassium inside the cell, higher sodium outside the cell. It makes, maintains that charge differential across the plasma membrane. And that's gonna keep um, coming up again and again and again. Now, this pump is like any other pump. Right? Think about like a pool pump or a hot tub pump or um, like a water pump in your car. Okay, 
even a bicycle pump, okay, or a tire pump. Have you ever plugged in the cigarette lighter, like a little tire pump, and then you stick it on your, your, your tire, and you run it for a while, and it sounds like, nah, 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 right, and they like hop around on the concrete, and then after it's done pumping up your tire, you feel that pump is warm. You know what I'm talking about? So this generates heat and helps to maintain a basal level of heat and is part of the functional metabolic heat production in our bodies. That's what I mean by keeps, keeps you warm all winter long. This winter might be working in you know, overdrive, might need some you know, layers or base layers to help, help you out, but 30 to 50% of all your ATP that you manufacture is used and consumed by your sodium potassium ATPase. Was there a question over here? Yeah. They're both positive. They're both positively charged. Okay, the question was, which one was negative? They're both positively charged. Okay, but let me back up to this slide where it's bigger. But because sodium that leaves in the sodium potassium ATPase pump, three sodium, that are, sodium is a plus one. So if you have three sodiums, now you're taking three positive charges out and you have a, a potassium, which is plus one, but you only brought in two. So because you brought in one less positive than you sent out, you have a net negative charge inside. Does that make sense? And so we'll learn that at this membrane, this is about minus 70 millivolts. I remember I told you on Monday, out of the wall is about 110, 120 volts. These are milli, one thousandth of a volt. And we're at 70 of those millivolts right here. And that's about where you want to be at resting membrane potential. Okay. So I'm setting the ground for action potential conversations and muscle uh, contraction physiology by this lecture. And these are the salient points that you've already learned, but I'm trying to put them in context to what we need you to remember. Okay. There are medications. There are medications that you'll give to your patients that actually may be poisons for this. That's a problem. Maybe it decreases the efficiency of the sodium potassium ATPase pump. That's a problem. You know, the back of the, of, of the package and all the side effects, you watch the commercials and they, the drug sounds great. And then it's like causes, you know, headaches and vomiting and diarrhea and, you know, flagellants. And you're like, oh, nah, maybe I won't take the medicine, right? Well, a lot of those side effects are because of what some of these medications do to the patient mechanistically. Okay, last topic. And then I'm, I wanna remind you, if you need access still to the online textbook, I'm gonna to try to show you after this class. We, I don't think we have anybody coming in after this. I'm gonna pause the videos and I'm gonna show you online how to do that again, okay? It's in the lecture um, from last Wednesday, but um, we'll do it real efficiently after class. Okay, bulk transport. This is the last slide and we'll let you out a little early. Macromolecules transporting, if, you, if the particle's too big and you can't shove it down you know, a carrier protein, then you actually have to use what we call endocytosis or phagocytosis if it's packaged in a vesicle. If you excrete it, it's called exocytosis, okay? That's what these terminologies mean. These pictures at the bottom, electron microscopy, across the top. This is the schematic drawing of the picture above it. So this is how cholesterol, like LDL, low density lipoprotein, is actually absorbed by the cell. Okay, this would be an example of endocytosis. Endo means like bringing it in. And, and, and an example of that would be penocytosis if it's a small molecule or phagocytosis if it's a large molecule. So you got receptors, they bind. The membrane, the, the plasma membrane, invaginates and then pinches off. And this becomes a sphere that houses the inner contents inside of the cell. And now it's part of the internal environment. Okay, and that's how this takes energy. Obviously, this is not this is active bulk transport energy required. Questions, comments. Okay, reminder, three quizzes due by Sunday evening. Hang tight if you still need access to your textbook.